You're listening to the Alan Gray Podcast. I'm Tim Ake, one of the portfolio managers at Alan Gray, and your host for this episode. The aim of this podcast is to share perspectives on topical issues that affect advisors and investors. We hope that these conversations will give you a sense of how we view the world and what we think about when building portfolios from the bottom up. Over the last few years, we've written extensively about the local banking sector. Although banks are generally geared to economic activity, Many local banks proved to be resilient through the COVID pandemic and have been good investments since then. But as we enter a period of high global inflation and slowing economic activity, how will the local banking sector fare? To help us delve deeper into this topic, I'm joined by my colleagues, Peter Kuernhoff and Sipasich Lezwane. As analysts on the investment team, they've spent time researching some of the biggest names in the sector and determining where the best opportunities lie. Uh, so, Peter, you started your career as a trainee chartered accountant. What drew you into the investment industry? It was actually a complete stroke of luck. So I was busy doing my master's and I really had no idea what I, what I wanted to do afterwards. I was fortunate enough to spend an hour with Stephen Mildenhall, who's a former chief investment officer of Alan Greyer. And at that stage, I got to spend an hour with him and, and see what it's like to be a fund manager. And it just it looked like a fascinating world where you can do research and get to know industries and companies and it's dynamic, it's real time. And from there, I applied to Alan Gray and never looked back. I actually didn't know that. So we already, all of us are learning something already. <laughs> That's great. And Sivasefla, you've been with Alan Gray and the investment team for about five years now. So what is it about our investment approach that resonates with you, if anything? <laughs> you know, there is right yeah. So before I came here, I did a lot of exploring and looking at different things and, and different interests to really figure out what makes sense for me. So what drew me to Alan Gray and investment approach is generally the focus on deep research and a longer timeline. So making high quality decisions and then letting it play over a longer time. I think it probably works quite closely to how I behave as a person as well. So trying a few things out, making the, doing the research and then thinking about the overall longer term impact. It does help make higher quality decisions rather than focusing on the news and what the scary things are now, but think about the earnings power of businesses rather than what's about to happen in the next six months or, or a week even. I mean, maybe on that topic of like looking longer term and versus the short term noise, if we think about the banking sector, Peter, through COVID, we had these massive drops in the share prices for all the South African banks and the market was obviously quite worried and, and we were buying quite a lot of the banks. So where do you think we were different? What did we see kind of differently to where the market was? I think we did a lot of work in the initial stages of COVID to understand how well the banks had been providing. So basically how much fat they kept behind to protect against you know loans that they'd made going bad. I think we had quite a contrarian view in terms of saying you know, we think the banks had a lot of capital. We think they would raised lots of provisions and that even if things turned out pretty bad, there'd probably still be enough fat there for them to be relatively good investments. Obviously, at the same time, the multiples that they were being valued on had fallen quite a lot. We thought there were quite big margins of safety there. And I think, as we'd all know, COVID turned out to be much less bad for, for a lot of, you know, SA corporates and individuals. And, and when those bad debts didn't materialize, the, the banks ended up being, you know, performing really well from a financial perspective. Maybe to add on that, if you did have a shorter term sort of view on, on investing, so if you investing within six months, a year, it's quite clear why someone would want to sell the banks, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you know that interest rates are about to go down, which impacts banks' earnings. You know that you're about to have very high losses from people who can't pay back their loans. So you know you're about to go into this, this big dip in earnings, and I, I guess when we looked a bit further on, we could see that the earnings power is not necessarily going away, but there'll be an earnings dip and how long that lasts versus the valuation is also the, some of the considerations we made at the time. Yeah, it's interesting thinking back now to April, May 2020, and you had like literally just this kind of panic selling. It's yeah. like you read about sort of in the textbooks like the, you know, the 1920s, 1930s, yeah. where the, we had these days where the banks were down like double digits or high single digits, the share prices. And clearly the market was really panicked. And I remember we were like trying to do the numbers, like not just saying like, oh, you know, directionally this is bad and the world's going to end, but actually trying to do the numbers on the bad debts. And 
some of the things we also, I remember, would be focused on quite a bit was the capital ratios and how the banks hadn't been lending that much before COVID. Mm-hmm. So it's very different to the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, mm-hmm. where you had this massive increase in lending before the crisis and then sort of a big fall in profits and lots of bad debts. We actually, this time around, we thought the banks were quite safe and you know we were building in all these like scenarios of even if they lose this much, it could actually still be a quite a good investment and the earnings mm-hmm. will recover. So it, it has come back quite nicely. And yeah, I guess the bad debts haven't been as bad as people thought, right? They, they probably actually surprised us even in terms yeah. of how they came out since then. Some of the ones people focused on, especially were NetBank and Investec, but maybe on NetBank, they have more property exposure. So people were quite a bit more worried there. Yeah. And, and how did that turn out? It would be scary when you think about it, right? So about a quarter of the overall lending in commercial property. And when malls are shut down and when people aren't in the office, Obviously, that has an impact on, on, on the ability of those businesses to pay back their loans. But that actually turned out way better than I would have thought and way better than the market would have thought. I mean, some reasons for that is just the starting what they call LTV, so the, the loan to the overall value of the properties or whatever security against the loan. And those, if they weren't incredibly high, they tend to be lower than home loans. Um, what that does is that even in a, in, a, in a very bad scenario, you have very good security on the loan, so you can take the, the property and, and you can sell that and generally get your money back. But even then, they didn't need to do that. So that didn't happen at all. So the serviceability, so I guess one metric they use is the interest coverage ratio. So how much earnings they have versus the interest they have to pay. And even at the worst of it, I think for a lot of the listed businesses, that was at two times. So they had double the amount of earnings to pay the interest that they needed to at the time. So that helped quite a bit. So with, with commercial property, you tend to have very big equity basis, so shareholders on the other side, and the debtors, so the, the, the banks is ahead of the, the shareholders. So in a bad scenario, the bank gets paid first, and then the shareholders get their money afterwards. And, and that kind of makes you more comfortable um, in, a, in a decline or in a shutdown scenario as well. Yeah, and, and maybe to give people some context, I think the net bank share price before COVID was something like 240, and it probably got down to below 80, I think. Mm-hmm. So four, yeah. fell sort of more than two thirds. And now we're back to above 200. So you've, it's quite similar, actually, to the financial crisis, where most of the banks fell like half to 60, 70 percent. And kind of within two years, they sort of back where they were. And earnings have more or less recovered for most of them, I think, right? So, yeah. I mean, if we look at the banks today, I guess we, I don't know if you agree, I think they're probably sort of on the cheaper side. So for many of them, earnings are kind of where they were two, three years ago. And valuations, like Peter said, are towards the lower end of history, I guess, right? Mm. Part of why earnings are back to pre-COVID levels is because bad debts are at historically low levels. And that, I think that's kind of true across the banks. But their underlying profitability, so you know, we often talk about something called PPOP, which is basically their profits if you take out the bad debts and the impact they have. That's still lagging a bit behind or kind of just coming back to, to pre-COVID levels. And the big question is now, okay, where to from here? You know, is there actually underlying economic growth or is it actually just, you know, these really low bad debt charges at the moment that's propelling the share prices forward? So maybe on the bad debts, I guess even globally, people are now sort of worried about potentially a global recession in SA. Obviously, the economy hasn't been doing too great. So you know, what does that mean for bad debt? Does it not mean we should be selling banks now if you're worried that we're going into a recession and actually bad debts? for the banks could go up a lot and their earnings could fall a lot. So bad debts are very sort of expectation-based, right? So in their models, the bank will expect X to happen. And if Y happens and Y is better than X, then bad debts tend to not go up as much as you think. So a lot of that is in, in providing. So what the banks will do, they'll take an income statement charge on what they expect future losses to be and, and they provide against those losses. And what we see now is that the provisioning, so the providing for, for those losses is higher than it was pre-COVID. So you can almost see that the banks expect losses to be bigger than they were before. I think in that sort of scenario, the banks provided, so losses can go up and, and it's not the end of the world. On the flip side, you have higher interest rates. So what higher interest rates do is they almost protect you on having higher credit losses. So when interest rates rise, the interest that you charge to your clients tends to rise by more than the interest that you have to pay on your deposits. And that protects you from higher credit losses that will obviously come because the reasons that interest rates are going up is inflation. What inflation is doing to people is it's making it more difficult for them to pay back their loans. So these things almost play off each other. Probably the best scenario would be interest rates rising at a nice steady pace without 
bad economic stuff. So like if the economy was growing and interest rates were rising, that that's probably would be number one, but you can't always get the number one scenario. Yeah, on the provisions, I think you said it well, it, it sort of depends what the expectation is. So you can almost think of the banks as putting aside some money for expected losses. If losses are worse than they expect, that's a problem. But if they're sort of in line, you've already kind of put that aside. So it doesn't really affect your earnings. It's kind of in line with your model. So maybe if we have a shock in interest rates or some kind of shock to the economy, you know, whatever that might be, that would be a bad scenario. But otherwise, we probably expect some kind of moderate increase in bad debts from here. That would be my, my expectation. We go back to sort of long-term average. Maybe it's a bit of a headwind to earnings. But then like Peter also said, we haven't really fully recovered from pre-COVID type levels. Yeah. So maybe if those normal kind of fees and other kinds of income for the banks recover, it kind of offsets and earnings maybe grow a little bit from here. I think that's about right. Yeah, it sounds about right. I think in the past where you've had big blow-ups is usually when credit you know, has been growing very strongly. So, so one of my favorite quotes about banks is one from Jim Grant. He says, the problem with money is credit and the problem with credit is people. Right. So it's usually when you, you've had this like massive credit boom when things really go pear shaped. But, you know, private sector credit hasn't really grown in SA much over the last decade. And even with the lower rates during COVID, people were taking out loans and it's, it's maybe like low double digit growth, but it's not growth the likes of you've seen in the UK or say in the US where, you know, you had this like booming property market and then suddenly there's a lot of lending going against that. And if that thing reverses, you, you could potentially have a lot of pain. And SA, it's, it's been quite muted. And as, as you were saying, the banks were keeping a lot of fat back. So I do think there's, there's quite a lot of downside protection in that sense. Yeah, it's also similar to when you look back at, at South Africa in sort of 2005, 2006, before the financial mm. crisis, you had this massive increase in lending by the mm. banks. So mm. credit was growing sort of 20% a year and everyone was taking a mortgage and the property prices were going up a lot. And then when you have a correction, you, you're starting from a high base and, you know, lots of loans were made that probably shouldn't be made and people were borrowing money, which they, you know, couldn't afford to pay back. So then you could have a problem, which like you say, we haven't had that the last few years. It's actually been quite a tough time. And that is, it's quite interesting when you look at some of the figures, right? So the demand for loans isn't going down. So people are still trying to get loans. They're still trying to purchase vehicles and homes. It's just that the banks are more cautious in giving new loans. So I think the numbers are, it's like, I think about 30% of loans applied for are actually granted at the moment. And that, that line has been coming straight down from like more than 50% pre-global financial crisis. So people still want to. I think that the banks are just more conservative on the, sort of the quality of credit and, and they're more cautious. You also see that in, in capital, right? So all the banks have what looks like excess capital, but you, you can almost tell that they, they're a bit nervous about what's going to happen in the next year or two. So they're keeping that excess capital to buy them opportunities, whether it's share buybacks like Investec is doing or... I mean, special dividends sometimes like first round did. So more capital than before, less lending than before. I mean, that might be negative for the economy, right? Because um, banks are quite important for kickstarting the economy. Yeah. So when you say excess capital, I guess what you're referring to is the banks have to hold a certain amount of capital according to regulations. And they're actually holding back more than that. So you could say they're being quite cautious or conservative. Cautious against regulation and cautious even against their own sort of longer term targets that the board set. Right. Yeah, yeah just keeping a bit of an extra buffer around yeah. for in case things are a bit worse. Maybe talking a bit about sort of the world macro situation. So we've seen high inflation around the world in Europe and in America with high energy prices and, and all these things. And it's it's come into SA as well. We, you know, inflation's been sort of 7 or 8%, which is higher than we expect. And I guess from Alan Gray's side, we've talked quite a bit recently about how we think that, you know, there's a reasonable chance that could continue for a few years. Actually, inflation might be quite hard to bring down. So what does that mean for banks if we have a high inflation environment? Would banks be a, a better investment or is that bad for them? I think there's pros and cons, but I think there's probably more cons in the South African context. I guess the big issue there is affordability, right? So if the cost of everything else is increasing quite a bit, then you, you really struggle to pay back your loans. And then at the same time, interest rates will rise and then your serviceability increases quite a bit. And especially if you're not in the most formal of employment, so if your income is not increasing to offset the inflation, you're being squeezed, I guess, by the, the higher cost of servicing your debt, the higher cost of fuel, higher cost of energy, and something has to give. That's one view of it. And then there's a benefit in, to some extent. If your income is growing, 
by more than that inflation, then it helps you almost inflate out of your debt. So if you bought a car worth 100,000 rand five years ago and your income was always growing by more than inflation, um, then that 100,000 doesn't look as big now versus what it did at the time. Yeah, there's definitely a trade-off here. I probably disagree with you a little bit. I think it's more on the positive side, but there's for sure a trade-off. So the point you mentioned earlier on the interest rates. So, you know, we know higher inflation typically goes with higher interest rates. We've seen the Reserve Bank raise the repo rate by about 3.5% over the last year. And as you explained, that's, that's quite positive for the banks. A big part of that sort of increases their interest income as they make more money on the loans and they don't give all of that back to the depositors. So that's quite a big tailwind. You know, it differs for each bank, but I think probably something like every 1% increase in interest rates gives you something like 5% in earnings, you know, something roughly like that. So it's quite a big multiplier there, which offsets some of that. I think there are two more aspects to it, though. And so the one is, we're used to inflation in South Africa, right? So South Africa inflation over the last decade has kind of been mid-single digit for most of that period. So going from, say, 5 6% over the last decade to 7 75 like you feel it, but it's it's not a train wreck. And I think the SARS has been great in terms of, you know, raising rates early. And it, it looks like inflation is peaking or close to it in South Africa. Where if you contrast that to, say, the UK or the US, where inflation was like 1% for a decade, and now suddenly it's like 10, 11, 12% at 40-year highs, that's a very different situation. So I think SA consumers, SA businesses are used to you know, some level of inflation and dealing with it. So I don't think it's as big of a shock on on the system. And then I agree with you, I think, on the on the lending side of it. You get high interest rates, higher interest income for the banks. But the other side of it is that the banks also get a lot of revenue from fees. And that would be, you know, people swapping their cards, their monthly account fees. And that's interesting because they've been struggling to push up those fees over time. And that's partly due to, you know, competition from Capitec and Discovery and the other new banks. But on the other hand, your costs are growing and your costs are growing at inflation plus a bit probably. It might be that on the what we call NIR, so non-interest revenue, so it's basically all the, the profits the banks make not from lending, it might be that on that side, you actually get squeezed quite a bit if, if inflation stays high. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess consumers have been sort of conditioned that bank fees shouldn't go up by inflation. They should in- hmm. only increase a little bit. Yeah. And when you see banks putting up fees by sort of 7 or 8%, you know, even though that's equal to consumer inflation, people are not happy with that. Yeah. That's mm. the, People have sort of been you know, gotten used to much lower increases, maybe even fees staying flat. And interest rates as well, there is an element of pace of increase, right? So fast, sharp increases do have quite a big of an impact on, on, on consumers versus steady impact over a prolonged time. The increases now have been quite sharp, and, and I think they'll probably have a bigger bad debt impact than they would have if they were spread over a longer period. The prime rate now is basically back to where it was before COVID, but where again, I, I'd probably contrast that to the US or the UK, where like you, you could take out mortgages there at like a 2% for a 30-year mortgage, and now suddenly that's gone from 2% to 6%. So you're like your monthly mortgage repayment yeah. has tripled. Like we're, we're not sitting with that. We're sitting with your monthly mortgage repayments back to where it was pre-COVID. And, you know, that's not great, but it's, it's not a transfer. Yeah, it's similar to the point you made on inflation. Like we used to sort of 6% inflation in South Africa. It's not really strange to everyone. We're, yeah. In America, it's a bit of a shock. And, and similarly on interest rates. Like if you're used to borrowing at two or three percent, and now you're borrowing at five or six percent, that's you know quite a big shock. Um, where in SA, if you if your home loan is ten percent or nine percent, sort of that's what people are used to, and yeah. it kind of seems to work or it kind of carries on. Maybe on the economic growth, so you know some of the pushback people might give on on owning bank shares is you know surely banks are so linked to economic activity, and if the SA economy is not growing or just you know, growing at a very meager rate, can it be a good idea to own banks? Yeah, look, it's, so I think it, it depends. So you can, for example, say you, the economy is not growing a lot, but the starting valuations are very low and, and competition isn't really intensifying. You could still get very good returns from that. But I think if you have this you know, the stars are aligning in a bad way in the sense that you've got weak economic growth. There have been a lot of new entrants to the banking sector recently. And for sure, like the valuations are still a bit low versus history, but but it's a lot higher than it's it was during COVID. I think you can start to make an argument for, sure, it'll be difficult for the banks to, to grow enough to, to justify the valuations kind of 
you know, from where they are now. Yeah, I guess you can also look at the recent history. Maybe the if you take out COVID as sort of a, a weird event, you know, the five years before COVID, the economy wasn't really growing much, mm-hmm. sort of one percentage on on average. And actually, the banks were pretty decent. So mm-hmm. okay, their starting valuations were a bit high, but they were they were making pretty good returns on capital. Yeah. They were paying out quite a lot in dividends. And if we look at them today, a lot of them are trading on sort of six, seven, or eight percent dividend yields. So you don't need much growth on top of that to get a good return. I guess you would think loan growth would be low from here. If the economies aren't going to grow, you can't grow your loan book by much. And that is sort of what you need to do in the long term if you really want to get proper growth on top of that. So if you think the banks are struggling to put up their fees by more than inflation, so you really need volume growth on you know, credit card swipes and people opening new accounts in order to grow. And, and if the economy is not growing, that's, that's just difficult to get a lot of growth on that. So I think they can, but but it, it's hard going. Yeah, it's, it's hard to escape that at the end of the day. I think also that, like, looking at recent history, is, it's quite interesting there. So you came from a period where loans to income went up quite a bit, and then po- post 2009, 2010, that's been coming down every year. So incomes have been growing, not not fast, but the, the sort of loans relative to that have come down. Because of regulations, global financial crisis regulations, um, at the same time, banks have been forced to keep more capital. So they were forced to not lend as much as they would have wanted to otherwise. You almost think since then, those levels might stabilize. So then you have loans growing closer to the economy or closer to incomes versus the, the recent history. So you almost don't have to even grow the economy by as much as you had to in the recent history um, to get similar levels of growth. But obviously, growth is, is helps a lot. But you did come out of a very weird period in that regulation was forcing banks to have almost a higher return on equity because you had to keep more equity. So you, it was becoming a more regulated business model than it was before. Yeah. So when you're talking about loan to income, we can kind of think about the private sector as a whole. So income was growing, but loans weren't growing as fast. You almost had like this headwind from regulation. After the financial crisis, you had sort of your leverage had to reduce a bit in the system. And now it's kind of normalized. And, and maybe from here, it's not as much as a headwind going forward. So it's almost like the, the health of the consumer should be better from here, and they should be able to handle their debt more than they could before. Right. Maybe something a bit more almost like philosophical. If we think of banks as businesses, and so, so we obviously weigh them up against all the other shares we can buy in, on the market, right? Do you think banks are good businesses to own? We often try and think like for different business models. You know, this is a good business model. This is a, a lower quality business model, so we want to pay a lower valuation. So where, where do you think banks kind of slot in that way of thinking. Yeah, so I think the one way I think about it is often when we think about whether something is a good business is we think about the return on equity. So, so basically, for each rand that the business has and invests, what's the return you get on that? And, you know, the banks kind of often make more than 20% return on equity, which, you know, just optically looks high and looks good. But the problem is the banks obviously have a lot of debt. They have a lot of leverage. So for each maybe 100 rand in in loans that you give out, you keep maybe like 12 rand of capital to back those loans, which isn't a lot. I mean, it's come down a lot. So, you know, in the financial crisis, US banks had maybe like $2 of equity for every $100 in loans. Like that makes me extremely nervous. You know, in South Africa, it's it's been very different. But part of why you've been able to generate returns is it is leverage. There, there is debt that's, that's juicing that up. And I guess the other side of it is there are barriers to entry. So it is complex to run a bank. There are lots of regulations. You need a lot of capital to start it up. You need technology. You need people. It isn't as simple as, you know, opening up a corner store or something like that. But I do worry that some of that's being eroded. And part of that's speaking to, you know, you've got something like Bank Zero starting to take deposits and and rolling out a fully fledged bank account with maybe having spent 200 million rand, which isn't a lot compared to what the other banks have spent. So I think there are parts of it that make it high quality, attractive businesses, but it remains fragile. And that's maybe why I think we've often been quite wary about taking too big position sizes on behalf of our clients in the banks, even though we might think they're quite attractive. For me, I think it's average to below average, and you almost see it on the multiples that they trade on versus the markets. 
some reasons on that. So, so obviously, Peter spoke about the, the returns on equity. But if you look at returns on assets, so, so take away mm. the, the gearing, that's quite low. You heavily regulate it, so you struggle to do what you'd want to do almost, which is, is quite tricky. And then the gearing does make it quite risky. So when there's things that happen in the economy, people don't think of, oh, we'll lose a year or two of earnings, but it's rather this thing could go out of business. And, and what happens if this thing goes out of business? And you start to worry a bit as a shareholder on, on, on making sure that you're not you don't have too big a position to be able to keep it going if things go very bad. So I think, yeah, so average to below average and, and, and the valuations almost support that. And as long as things don't go bad, you can actually do quite well because the valuations are not very high as a result. Yeah, I agree with you on the risk points. On the competition, it is interesting. You know, the regulation can go both ways. It obviously hurts you and it makes it harder to do business. And you know, banks are extremely highly regulated in South Africa and it adds to cost of doing business. But on the flip side, like you said, it, it's hard for a new entrant, mm-hmm. right? It, it's not easy to start a new bank, right? <laughs> like as lots of people have learned. And we've seen this in lots of other industries, right? If we think of British American tobacco, it's yeah. an extremely highly regulated industry and it's extremely profitable. And the regulation is sort of a barrier to entry or sort of a moat, which can be positive. And I guess we've looked at some other countries as well. And, and the two parallels people sometimes make are Australia and, and Canada where you have sort of a similar market structure. In SA, we've got four or five big banks, which is similar to those countries, which is obviously not a monopoly, but Mm. it's not like they're 20 competitors, right? Mm. So in South Africa, if we look at the banks, like they make pretty high returns on capital, not ridiculous levels. I think sort of consumers are getting a reasonable deal, but the banks are able to make a pretty decent profit. And it would be hard for a foreigner to come in, Mm. for example, Mm. even if you JP Morgan or Citibank or a massive you know, global bank, it's hard for you to come into mm. Africa and compete here, mm. given the scale the local players mm. have, which kind of protects you in a way, because mm. that's always a big risk, right? There's some new competitor that comes along and, and kind of eats your lunch. But I, I guess even on that, so if you think about like Capitex or Saint on the retail side, the other retail banks have all grown their retail profits over mm. the last decade. If someone had told me before, and Capitex is going to go from just called zero to like, I don't know what the industry market share is now, but let's call it 25% market share uh, by clients. Like you'd you'd think the other banks are going to have serious, serious trouble. And they maybe didn't shoot the lights out, but they they kind of kept the show on the road. I think part of the valuations is maybe, you know, it is a mature industry. There are, you know, five, six, seven established big players in SA. And, you know, if you do well, maybe you're growing at, real GDP plus inflation plus one or two, three percent, which is okay, but you're not you're not shooting the lights out. So it's difficult to to justify, you know, paying very high multiples for those businesses though. I guess with Capitec the, the rare thing that they did was they were able to grow the market yeah. and bank the previously underserved or the yeah. unbanked. And their timing was also good. So the yeah. right timing for things to happen there. I think that would be very difficult now when when things are growing a bit slower yeah. to try take market share from the big guys. I mean, first of all, the other banks learn from Capitec. So they've all reduced their fees quite a bit. At the same time, they've all spent quite a bit on on technology. So they have better digital offerings, which makes it quite difficult to come at them on a digital level or to come at them at a fee level or to come at them at a serviceability level. I think it's very different now. I think they're a bit shocked by what happened many years ago and they're probably better able to react now than they were before. Yeah. Peter, you wrote an article on one of our quarterly commentaries a while back on Capitec and how they were able to sort of do what they did. Other than the points we spoke now, so sort of targeting a new area of the market and maybe a, a technology advantage. Were there any other major ingredients in their success that we can learn from? Yeah, look, so I think the, the tech maybe was an advantage in the beginning, but not after the first few years. If you talk to them about it, they'd say, if you put in a new system this morning, it's legacy by this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to keep, you know, updating it. You have to keep rejigging it. You have to add a new functionality for, for, for the clients and, new regulations, new products. So I think, you know, for sure they had an advantage initially in that, you know, they had a newer system off the shelf. But since then, I think they've done a really good job of managing it. But the other part of it was just really keeping what they were doing very, very simple for the client. So only one type of account, you know, only doing retail. So you could do a lot of transactions that are very, very similar and automate it, just start doing it at a very, very big scale and doing that very, very efficiently. And 
now as they've kind of grown in the retail market, you can see, you know, they're, they're trying to launch a business bank now. And that's really moving quite far from what they've been doing previously. And the big question is, okay, can they succeed on that? And they might grow the market. You know, I think there are a lot of SMEs who are tremendously underserved in SA, but being able to replicate that success mm -hmm. is, is a tall order. And I think the jury's out on whether they'll be able to do that. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see once they launch their offering for small businesses, how that competes yeah. with the other banks. But it, it is interesting you mentioned, so with their growth over the last 20 years, Capitec kind of brought down fees for consumers. So they obviously offered lower fees, but they effectively forced the other banks to either lower fees or, or to not increase fees. Yeah. And that's been good for consumers. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously hurt the other banks. But as you say, they've actually, in many cases, still been good investments, even yeah. despite that, yeah. which is interesting. I think it's not just the fees, so that's part of it. But the other thing is, you know, just better customer service, yeah. which is difficult to measure. So yeah. if you go back 20 years, banks were open from, you know, 10 to 2. With a lunch break in between. <laughs> yeah, and, and not on weekends. And something like a 24-hour call center or something that didn't exist. And I think Capitec was quite innovative in, in terms of giving customers better service. And that increases the operating costs for the banks, mm. but it is a benefit for you, me, and the, the person on the street. Yeah. And the share like Capitec, obviously, it was this really big winner over 20 years. You know, if you bought it at one rand when it listed, you, you probably retired by, by now. Do you think that's the kind of share that's hard for Alan Gray to kind of find? Like we, we tend to be more value type investors where Capitec's typically more like been a growth type share. And, you know, people might say like, oh, you're always going to miss those kind of shares if, you, if you're not open to these massive growth potentials. Yeah, we've had a very interesting history in terms of, you know, buying and selling the share for our clients. The share has obviously done phenomenally well and first prize would have been, you know, just going all in on Capitec on day one and just holding it. But at the time, you don't know, right? And for every Capitec that makes it, there's an African bank that blows up or other banks that don't make it. How we've actually kind of been positioned in the share over time was interesting in that when African Bank was blowing up, we bought quite a material position on Capitec for our clients. And then Capitec was kind of falling in sympathy with African Bank. And that's, you know, people thought Capitec would also come under a lot of pressure and they, they came through that. And then the second time we bought quite a big slug was after the Viceroy report came out on Capitec, which feels like a long time ago. But I mean, at the time, Capitec's share price basically halved. People were flogging it without any regard for valuation. And, you know, there was complete panic selling. We also bought a position for our clients at that stage. And it turned out that a lot of what Viceroy said was patently untrue about Capitec. And then the last one was during COVID, where, you know, as COVID was, was emerging and people were saying, sure, like a bank on 30 times earnings, you know, very high valuation, making unsecured loans. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's going to be mass job losses. This is probably a bad idea. And again, the Capitec share price halved, and we, we actually bought, bought quite a position for our clients during that time too. So I think what I'm saying with that story is typically at Allen Gray, because we are valuation-driven investors, it's difficult for us to pay a high multiple for a company just because you don't have a margin of safety. Mm -hmm. There's often such high expectations baked into the share price that – if it just turns out a little bit worse than you were expecting, you know, the share price can fall quite a lot. And you, you see that, say, happening with the big U.S. tech companies now. But Capitec has been very interesting in that you've always had another chance to buy back in. And whether it's Viceroy or whether it's COVID or whether it's another bank blowing up, it's almost like you always get another chance to for the valuation to fall and, and, and for you to start getting back into it again. Yeah, the Viceroy incident was interesting. I guess this is about four years ago when it happened. And at the time, I think what helped us is we already knew the company well. Yeah. So I think at that stage, we probably had very low shareholding or, or maybe yeah. even nothing in, in Capitec. And, but we knew the business well. We, yeah. we were covering it in detail. We thought it was a very high quality business. Yeah. And then when you had this event with a short seller putting out all these allegations, we were kind of able to go through those allegations in detail yeah. and make up our own mind on what we think was true or not true and, and then able to quite quickly yeah. you know, take advantage of that dislocation in the market yeah. and, and buy some shares. So that worked quite well. I think it's maybe an important broader lesson that 
you know, even for shares that we might not own for our clients, like say Richmond or MTN, where, where our clients don't have a position in that, we still do a lot of work on those shares because you, you never know what happens. I don't know, like China invades, invades Taiwan and then suddenly Richmond halves. Like you want to know what you think the company is worth because you never know when, when there might be opportunity to buy into it. Yeah. With something like Capitec, people often assume, you know, if Alan Gray doesn't own the share, we don't like the business or mm. we worried about yeah, the business or something, sure. which might not be the case at all. It might just purely be valuation. We just mm. think they're cheaper things to, to yeah. buy. Maybe on the point of competition, just, just back to that, Peter, you mentioned Discovery Bank. So Capita coming into the market, you know, initially people were skeptical and over time they took a lot of market share and it was obviously bad for the other banks. And now it feels like they're Quite a lot of people are trying to come in the market and Discovery, I guess, is sort of the more notable one and they've launched Discovery Bank and previously they had these credit card clients. Is that something we should be very worried about as shareholders of the other banks? There are a couple of ways in which it can play out and it's often quite difficult from the outside to kind of observe it. So the one thing with, with Capitec, which I think was, was very clear, was from day one they were growing their primary banking clients. So that's people who deposit their salaries into their Capitec bank account. But what was also happening was people were using those accounts. So the average deposit on that account per Capitec account was growing. And then also the amount of swipes and spending that people were doing per Capitec account was growing. And that was showing you that it's sort of very sticky clients. From there, I think you could work out, okay, they're taking material market share. The problem with, with some of the other new entrants now is they're signing up a lot of clients, but it takes a while before that starts translating through into people switching their salaries to, to those banks and you know building up deposit bases there and using that as the first card that they swipe when they, they try and pay for something. So I think it's something to keep an eye on. And I guess the other risk which I worry about is they don't necessarily have to grow a lot of market share to put the other banks under pressure. So it could be that they offer better service levels. It could be that they just induce more competition on, on banking fees. Mm -hmm. So even if they don't win necessarily, it might be that it puts the other banks under pressure. So it is definitely, you know, an intensifying competitive environment in that sense is a big risk to the other banks. Coming from all ways, right? Coming from telcos, coming from banks. So... It's always a concern and watching how the banks react to it. So how much money are they putting behind IT? How much is of that is defensive? How much makes sense for their own strategies? And, and how do they react? Almost, do you not lose too much just to defend yourself against someone who's too small? Or do you wait for the, someone who's too small to become too big? And it's playing off that balance. But I think the bigger banks are very aware of the market at the moment. They're concerned, they've learned, and they try to react by making their serviceability better. Maybe take an example of NPS scores, right? So banks in general globally tend to have very low NPS scores. Just and explain what's, a, what's a so NPS? NPS score is net promoter score. So the higher the net promoter score, the more your clients like what you, what you do for them. So um, banks tend to be between 40 and 50. A very good business can be at like a 70, 80 score. Um, that's like an excellent business. It's like an 80 plus. So banks generally are, are low. Maybe an example, net banks, digital NPS score 71 versus the rest of the businesses in the 40s. So the more you bring people onto your digital platforms, naturally people tend to enjoy interacting with you as a bank. So, so how do you react to these, these challenges? You, you do things that make sense without betting the business or putting too much at risk to compete with smaller players. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting point because some of the pushbacks people might sometimes give on, on the banking shares is, you know, surely consumers just get a bad experience. Like, it seems like everyone you ask to has, like, some horror story with whatever bank mm -hmm. it might be of, like, something that went wrong or, like, staying in a queue for or being on a call center line for hours trying to find the right person. And, and people say, like, these, how can you own these businesses? They're just so terrible and it's just bureaucracy and the IT so bad. And, you know, I have all these anecdotes. So it's, you obviously want to take that into account, but mm -hmm. it might not tell the, the whole story. I mean, you must almost think about, like, I don't know, five, 10 years ago when you'd have to queue to deposit money and have to fill in those slips. And then a few years later, you could take the money and put it in the ATM. Now you're, you're like, you hardly ever need to yeah. use the money. You can just transfer it on your cell phone. So I, I guess it, it is a framing sort of thing. And it's, it is money. It's a sensitive topic and it is emotional for people. But I think by and large, as banks have digitized, 
the service level has improved. Maybe to what you were saying, Tim, but how many of those people actually changed banks? That's always the fascinating thing for me is, you know, this person would complain about how they nearly went to war with their bank and how much they hated. <laughs> they still bank there. So in that sense, I think because the switching costs are high, it, it's a flippant headache to, you know, change your mortgage over, change your facilities, change your debit orders, change all of that. That means that the service that it, another bank has to offer has to be so much better in order to, to induce people to, to switch on a, on a big scale. And then I don't think people are going to switch for, you know, a five rand a month difference on fees. So for sure, when Capitec was starting and they were discounting on fees heavily, I think that was making a big difference. But now, you know, a lot of the market fee rates of, you know, across the banks have actually converged. There isn't that much of a difference anymore. So I think that's making it harder and harder for the banks to actually get customers to switch between them. Yeah, it definitely depends what your alternatives are as a consumer, yeah. right? And I think like you pointed out with Capitec initially, they were probably offering better service in many sort of dimensions, like banks being, mm. branches being over over weekends, the fees were a lot lower. And as the other banks have kind of had to adjust and become more competitive, it sort of leveled the playing field a little bit. Mm. And now actually maybe it's not as obvious that the one might be better than the other one. And I think also focusing too hard on getting share can be a bit risky when you look at the businesses. You could almost try to use home loans and, and, and offer aggressive rates to switch people to your retail bank. But that does come with risk, right? So aggressive rates, you, you have to sort of try to price for the risk. And if you're giving someone a rate that no one else wants to give, there's going to be a squeeze on your lending margin. So especially if you're adjusted for risk. So if you're adjusted for the amount of people in that group of people that you try to get with aggressive rates, if you adjust that for how many people don't pay back, sometimes it's not the best sort of allocation of capital to do it that way. Maybe moving just to sort of a bit more macro type theme on the South African fiscal situation. So, you know, it's sort of widely publicized. Everyone kind of knows about our problems with the deficit and our government debt to GDP and all those challenges. So how does that play into investing in the banks? So I guess the banks own a lot of government bonds. You know, how, how should we think about that dynamic? I think there are a couple of ways in which it filters through. So the one is obviously like the banks own, I don't know, maybe 20 to 30% of their assets are parked in government bonds. And then that are also very, very intrinsically interlinked with the South African government just by virtue of how the South African banking system is set up. So if you think for whatever reason South Africa has a sovereign debt crisis, that is going to spill over into a banking crisis. Like I don't think there's any way to, to avoid that. So in that sense, the banks are very intrinsically tied to what happens to South African government debt and the macros. I think that is a kind of a tail risk to, to consider. But on the other hand, it does look like there has been progress and there has been some kind of a stabilization in terms of the outlook for, you know, South Africa's debt levels. There's some fudging there. So we rebased our GDP and, you know, there's a lot of promises in there about, you know, limiting growth and public spending, specifically, you know, public sector wages and things like that. But it is, it is a long-term risk that I do think worry ourselves included when it comes to, to taking big positions in the banks. I think there's also the cost of equity yeah. risks, right? So if you the chief financial officer of a business and you're deciding whether to build a new plant or a new factory, you almost compare the hurdle rate, so how much, what return can you get on this new factory versus at least beating the government bond. So if you can't beat the government bond, why build a factory when you can just put the money at the government bond and have a lower risk? And people tend to also value banks relative to South African government bonds. So similar sort of risks to some degree. And the higher the government bond yield, the higher the earnings yield you tend to see for banks. And that's a similar thing, right? So why buy something at a 8% earnings yield when you can buy 10% earnings yield on a government bond with lower risks as well? So it does matter for, for the actual ability to grow your lending and the valuation that's put on the banks over a long enough time. It's definitely something we think about in our asset allocation portfolios. Mm -hmm. So as you said, you know, you can buy a South African government bond at an 11% yield. So you're lending money to the government and it's you know, pretty low risk. Or you can buy the shares of a bank at, let's say, a 7% dividend yield. So you need quite a bit of growth mm -hmm. to actually do better. And, and of course, you're taking on more risk. So is it actually mm -hmm. worth it? Yeah. 
and that's obviously the same kind of decision making foreign investors are, mm. are faced with as well. So you do get this effect that if SA government bond yields are going up, it's probably not great for the share prices of banks. And that's mm. a bit of what we've seen over the last two years, I guess, where the valuations for the banks seem reasonably low mm. compared mm. to history as bond yields have gone up. I guess they can diverge probably quite materially for the short term or e- even mm. the medium term. But over the long term, I, I do think it's difficult to escape that. So so on our portfolios in the Allen Gray funds, our clients mostly have exposure to Net Bank and Standard Bank would be the larger positions and then a bit less to First Rand and, and Investec. At the moment, we've got about 14% or so of South African shares in, in the banking sector split across those positions. If you were running the portfolios, would you do anything different there? Would you have more exposure, less exposure, nothing in the banks? What do you think? Personally, I would increase exposure. And I think the main reason is, so low valuations, the starting expectations aren't very high. So everyone reads the same risks about the economy in the news. The banks know about it. They're well provided. So people are not expecting great things economically and growing wise as well. And I think on these sort of valuations relative to the market, it, it, they are very attractive. But maybe on the flip side, there is a risk element to it. So you don't want to have too big a position in the overall portfolios in banks because they are, at the end of the day, highly geared. So they, they do get impacted quite deeply by the economy. There is a, a big sort of correlation to the economy. I've got a quite a strong preference for banks that I think what I'd refer to as organic growth. So for me, banks where I think the franchise is growing, where you know, a lot of the earnings growth now is not just coming from, you know, lending to the marginal, next marginal client and sort of low bad debts versus history, which you think those bad debts would, would normalize and tick up over time. I'd have a preference for banks that I think are growing on a sort of underlying organic basis, so actually growing client numbers, growing uh, that non-interest revenue. But then also to what Sipasikhu was saying, you, you know, I think there's enough SA macro risk that you, you don't necessarily want to double up on that. And, and so just being quite cognizant of position size. And then from a multi-asset class you know, perspective, it is a very, very interesting trade-off where you're sitting with you know, SA government bond at 10 and a half now, which you can get risk-free. That's attractive. So, so why would you go and take the risks to buy into the banks? So I think there is a place for them in a portfolio, but I, I wouldn't be going into a big overweight South African banks at this stage. Great. Yeah, I think you've given us a nice summary. So we'll, we'll leave it there for today and until next time. Thanks. Thank you to my colleagues, Peter Kuernhoff and Sibisich Lezwane for joining me. We spoke about how we use our rigorous investment approach to evaluate opportunities in the banking sector. We then moved on to talking about the current global environment and how it impacts the outlook for local banks, as well as some specific risks and opportunities. We always welcome your feedback, suggestions and questions. If you'd like to get in touch, you can send an email to info at allengray.co.za. Lastly, Alan Gray is an authorized financial services provider. To view the T's and C's, explore the latest investment insights and find out more about our offering, please visit alangray.co.za. Until next time, I'm Tim Acker from Alan Gray. This podcast was produced by Volume. Thanks for listening.